I am Paul Johnson. I am the deputy director here at the Brooklyn Museum, and um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome such a large crowd um, this afternoon to this very um, prestigious panel that we're about to hear. Um, unfortunately, the director of the museum, Arnold Lehman, could not be here. He is in New Orleans talking about community-based museums. Um, so he asked me actually to read the following comments to you um, before we get going. Um, he says, four years ago, with an enormous amount of pride and excitement, Elizabeth Sackler and I had the honor of representing the entire Brooklyn Museum community in the unveiling of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Years of hard work and planning led up to that important day, and I remember so clearly how excited we both were to get started on the public aspect of this great adventure. And these four years have indeed been a great adventure, an adventure <clears throat> and a learning experience and an awakening for me and I hope for all of us who have intersected in some way with the Sackler Center. One of the most remarkable things for me from our perspective four years on is the degree to which the center has become such an integral part of the museum, allowing us to incorporate a new and unique voice within our institution and in the process, expand our dialogue with our visitors and beyond about the social, political, cultural, and artistic voices which may not have been perceived prior to um, four years ago. The Sackler Center focuses on the voices and contributions of women, the concerns of women, which by extension are, of course, the concerns of humanity, is a fact which I am particularly proud. Today's panel is a wonderful example of this, and I want to thank Gloria Steinem for making possible this important public presentation and discussion about the sexual violence against women in the Holocaust. My thanks to Elizabeth Sackler are, as you might imagine, difficult to quantify. Examples illustrating her commitment to this institution and her vision for the center are all around us, and her legacy continues to grow as we celebrate yet another year of our continuing work together. For me, it is impossible to talk about the anniversary without inevitably also talking about the future. And I want to close by taking this opportunity to invite you all here today to continue to play an increasingly active role in the future of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Thank you for being here today. That from Arnold Lehman. I just want to add on a personal note, I have been at the museum for about a year. Um, and one of the first people that I met a year ago was Elizabeth Sackler. Um, uh, she got me early on, as she likes to say, and together we have been um, talking a lot about uh, the future of the Sackler Center, not only for the fifth anniversary next year, but for years beyond. And I can promise you that with Elizabeth's um, tremendous leadership at this institution, the future of the Sackler Center is quite bright. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce um, Dr. Sackler, um, and get on with our panel. And can I just remind you all, please, to silence your cell phones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I'm going to ask you to say good afternoon back to me, because this is quite a day. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. You know, um, I do this. Can we lower the mic a little bit? Because um, I have a cold. And so I have had Sudafed, and you know what that can do to you, so I'm very, very excited. <laughs> I, um, I do a lot of speaking, and this particular day is sort of a tricky wick of a day, and it is so because uh, there is so much going on. So I've been trying to figure out how I would start my remarks for this day. And I'm going to start by... Um, announcing or reminding, depending on whether or not you were there, to hear her say that Gloria self-describes as a stand-up comic wannabe. Now, this is really important because I am a self-described revolutionary wannabe, and I think of that as uh, being seriously aggressive if you don't have a stand-up comic wannabe side. Uh, which, of course, Gloria does, and she is also the only uh, stand-up comic wannabe that I think is funny. In fact, <laughs> she is. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, even though I consider that I have a really great sense of humor, and I do, uh, today is tough, 
um, and it's tough because uh, about we're about a lot of things today, and um, we're about really serious issues, and we are also about celebrating, as Paul said, the fourth anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for the Feminist Art. And not only do we, all of us, have a center for feminist art, but it is a center for feminist everything. And uh, that is um, deeply about making our world a better place. And of course, so making the world a better place is um, what makes me smile. And I couldn't have done the center without thanking the director, Arnold Lehman, and deputy directors, and Paul, and Sally, and Matthew, and Radia, and the education and public programming departments, David, Ken, all the wonderful docents in the museum, and also the wonderful security guards who work in the center and who adore the center so. And thank you to our curator, Catherine Morris, and the team at the Sackler Center, uh, Sarah Giovanelli, who has been with us since we opened. Thank you. And uh, program director and woman by my side every day, Rebecca Taffel. I thank you so much. And uh, we have fabulous men and women who are in the Council for Feminist Art. And if you are interested in becoming a, council, a member of the Council, to be more involved with the Center in a various ways. Uh, it's possible. Uh, there are brochures at the entrance uh, for you to pick up uh, on your way out. So um, the biggest thanks really go to all of you and to all of the visitors who come to the center to see the home of the dinner party, to um, participate or uh, witness. Uh, we've had scores, hundreds of wonderful, provocative uh, really progressive panels since the beginning, since our opening, and of course, all of our exhibitions in the Feminist Gallery, which now has a Lorna Simpson exhibition in it, and our very own Herstory Gallery, which is the only one in the only center for feminist art in the world. Um, our museum numbers, uh, according to the museum, as a result of all of your participation and coming here, hello, Lola, uh, is 25%. We bring in 25%, the center does, of visitorship, or putting it another way, 25% of the people who walk into the Brooklyn Museum walk into the Brooklyn Museum to come to the Center for Feminist Art. And this is, of course, a very, very great thing. And uh, so I continue on about my ruminations, uh, thinking about how to approach a moment like this of celebration when the world is coming apart at the seams. And uh, we have the good fortune, actually, of today's panel, Gloria Steinem moderating sexual violence during the Holocaust and other genocides with a stellar panel, indeed. Sanja Hedgepeth and Rochelle Siddell are co-authors of Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, an absolute groundbreaking book, and I'm delighted they're here. Maman John is here, for founder of the Shalupi, Shalupi? Shalupi, sorry, foundation, and uh, Naval, author, Naval Semel, and co-founder of Equality Now, uh, Jessica Newworth. Um, so how do I concurrently celebrate and discuss the horrors of the world, past and present? Um, so I was doing about it. And my friend and feminist historian, Deborah Schultz, who is here today, said to me that she has been immersed for decades in horrors. And her life preserver is that women resist, resistance, resilience, survival, she said. And I love that, resistance, resilience, survival. So I invite you at 4.30 to a book signing for our wonderful new book and the celebration of our fourth anniversary and to toast resistance, resilience, and survival as we mend our world. And um, speaking of mending our world with the same tenacity as Gloria, Gloria had admitted to me, I'm, I'm telling her all her secrets, but I'm sorry, Gloria, I can't help it, that she also has a mix, miss, fix it mentality. Of course, um, if you have 
a misfixit mentality, but you also fix it, then it's a very great thing. And on multiple occasions, I have had the pleasure, and it is a pleasure, and it is an honor, to introduce Gloria. And actually, it doesn't get any easier. In fact, I'm finding today that it's getting harder. The second anniversary, anniversary Gloria moderated sex trafficking and new abolitionists. Um, and uh, at the Georgia O'Keeffe Awards, I had the privilege and the honor of going with her to New Mexico to introduce Gloria in front of an audience of 2,000 people in a town that has many, um, boasts as many new age therapists in their uh, yellow book as we have lawyers in our yellow book, so that when I said, when I come back in my next life, I want to be Gloria Steinem, everybody in that audience really, really got it. But, <laughs> but we are uh, here today, and I want to tell you about uh, how I met Gloria. I met Gloria because she was invited and accepted to do a keynote um, address at the art table luncheon where I was um, being honored uh, a year before the center opened, but for the founding of the Center for Feminist Art. And I must say that next to having two children and three grandchildren and four great friends and one great lover and birthing the Center for Feminist Art, uh, Gloria Steinem is the best thing that's happened to me. <laughs> so uh, I won't tell you about therefore, how tongue-tied I was when I first met Gloria, uh, she being the first icon that I ever met. And I won't tell you about my first phone call to Gloria when I apologized for bothering her. I'm really sorry to bother you in this little voice. And Gloria said to me, get over it. <laughs> and I won't tell you about how my son Michael, who was at McGill University at the time of the opening of the center, oh, at the time of the, open, uh, of the awards that Gloria uh, was keynote speaker, speaker, speaker at, uh, you can tell the Sudafeds kicked in. So, um, he told his friends at McGill College that he was coming down and his mother was getting really this great prestigious award and he was going to meet Gloria Steinem. They did not want to hear about my award. They didn't care that his mother was getting an award. They wanted to hear all about Gloria Steinem. And when he returned, he had to report all about Gloria Steinem. So it's one of the best things that's happened to my son, too. I also won't tell you about how at the very opening of the center, um, my 33, she was then 33-year-old warrior for Planned Parenthood niece, uh, came up to Gloria, ran up to Gloria Steinem and said to her, um, I have to thank you. I just have to hug you. I need to hug you and I need to thank you. Can I do that? I will tell you that introducing Gloria with her accomplishments is like counting stars in the sky on a clear night. And I have little parentheses in my notes saying, could I dare say that counting stars on a gorgeous night is the most awesome thing, but it could get a little bit boring. So I started to think about the essence of Gloria. And uh, then came the comparisons. Gloria Steinem is like the Pied Piper. Look how many people are here. Gloria Steinem is like the New York Post Office. Neither wind, nor rain, nor sleet, nor hail keeps Gloria from her appointed rounds. And now I say, move aside James Joyce, because next comes Marilyn Monroe. And I decided that Gloria Steinem is a girl's best friend and to hell with diamonds. <laughs> then I realized that being Gloria Steinem is probably like being the Dalai Lama. To be compassionate, brilliant, erudite, spiritual, effective, beloved around the world. And I know at this moment well, actually, before I say that, I have to say that it's probably better than that because I think everybody in China also loves Gloria Steinem. I know Gloria is now thinking, this day is not about me. Get on with it, Liz. Enough. Stop. Cut. So I will. But thank you for being in my life, Gloria, and thank you for being here today. 
You know you are alive when some things really get to you and things get you really riled up. And if you are here, you are probably very alive and you are probably really riled up. If you hadn't noticed, and I'm sure you have noticed, there is and has been an ongoing war against women. That this country uh, is at war against Planned Parenthood, against women's health, against women. There are women who are at war against other women in this country and in the world. A woman would have to have her head in the sand not to recognize the war on women, and all around the world, ranging from the yucky and the horrific to everything in between, I say none of it is acceptable. A few weeks ago, my honey and I went down to the rally uh, for Planned Parenthood, and it was a great rally. And uh, there's nothing like getting your blood circulating. And on that day, there was a f it was a few days into the revolution in Egypt. Uh, it was only a few days old. It was before the earthquake, and it was before the uh, AKA no-fly zones. So I start thinking about comfort zones and its relativity. Comfort zone. Most of the women in the world have been at one time or another way outside of anyone's level of comfort zone. I am told that it was phrased by Charlotte Bunch, and it's now attributed, of course, to Hillary Clinton in Beijing when she said, women's rights are human rights, human rights are women's rights. And I say sexual violence is not acceptable. I say women rights are human rights. Spousal abuse is not acceptable, and I say women's rights are human rights, and genital, genital mutilation is not acceptable, and I say women's rights are human rights, and I don't want to be the only one standing up here and saying that, so I'm going to ask all of you to stand up. I'm not kidding. Please join me. I don't want to be alone in this. I say sex trafficking is not acceptable, and we say women's rights are human rights. Sex slavery is not acceptable, and we say women's rights are human rights. Rape camps are not acceptable, and we say women's rights are human rights. Systematic rape of women during war is not acceptable, and we say women's rights are human's rights. And I really don't want to be the only one to say three times in a row, please join me, women's rights are human rights, women's rights are human rights, women's rights are human's rights, and join me in welcoming Gloria Steinem and her outstanding panel, and thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. I think there's any other museum director in the world after whom an organizer is an anticlimax? <laughs> <laughs> the Dalai Lama? I've never been compared to the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Although I have to say he looks better in a skirt than I. <laughs> Are we all? Um, really hard to proceed after that. I was thinking while Elizabeth was talking that the bridge between being a stand-up comic and being an organizer or whatever it is we all hope to be to change the future is laughter. Because I, I figured out not so long ago that the reason it matters so much to us is because it's the only free emotion Fear can be compelled, as we know. Even love can be compelled. If we're isolated and dependent for long enough, we think we're in love. But laughter is free. It comes from realizing a truth when two unexpected things coincide. I understand that Einstein had to be very careful when he shaved in the morning 
because when he thought of something quickly, he laughed and he cut himself. <laughs> <laughs> so we have something very precious in this room today, which is a chance to hear the truth about the past so we can change the future, so we can have more laughter. We owe this gift to Elizabeth Sackler, you know, she not only started the Center for Feminist Art, the first one, the only one in the world, but she has always made sure that art and life were never separate. Four years ago, when the Center opened, she brought art by women from every continent, but she brought the artists so they could meet each other. And the Center has always had a place for meetings as, as well as for art. Um, and of course, she gave a home to the great women in history of the dinner party. And I hope you'll come to the reception and the book signing afterwards, because I think the women at that table would be very happy that we're here today. Um, every event like this has a story. And my part of this one began this summer when I read a manuscript of sexual violence against Jewish women during the Holocaust, the landmark anthology by Sonia and Rochelle, whom you'll be hearing from the first book in English after some 60 years to reveal the truth of the sexual abuse of Jewish women. I was stunned. Where had these facts been at Nuremberg? Where had they been in my textbooks? Why had they been suppressed? And most painful of all, if we had known those facts, might we have been better able to prevent Bosnia, Rwanda, the Congo, the Sudan, and so much more? After all, I, I'm not a historian, but I had 30 years ago belatedly discovered Ravensbrück, the largest all-female concentration camp, and that also wasn't in my textbooks. I learned about the horrific medical experiments there, but not about the sexualized violence there. Later, when I was researching an essay called If Hitler Were Alive Today, Whose Side Would He Be On? Uh, which I was enraged enough to write because anti-abortion groups here were comparing pro-choice activists with Nazis. Such facts still weren't present. I mean, I could learn that Hitler closed down family planning clinics, declared abortion a crime against the state as one of his first acts, um, and banned feminists from employment in the same law that banned Jews from employment. I could learn that he forced so-called Aryan women to have children, even founded, as we know, Lebensborn born or baby farms, while doing away, of course, with Jews, Gypsies, Poles, Africans, and other non-Aryans. Yet I didn't learn the facts that you will read in this historic anthology. Fortunately, I work with a lot of smart and dedicated women at the Women's Media Center, and we decided to do whatever we could to get the message of this book out and to connect it to examples in the recent past and present. With the help of Barbara Becker, an expert on both women's rights and human rights, who's in the front row here and who's going to keep time for us, uh, and communications, we've organized this as our first event, our first visceral event. Thanks to the Holocaust Museum in Washington and its office in New York, we have had an event in which we were able to connect these things intellectually. But this is the first time that we've done so in person. And the first time that some of us have met each other. I mean, this is maybe the most important panel in my long life of panels that I have ever uh, taken part in. So we hope to publicize these past facts, learn from their links to the present, and help prevent this pattern in the future. To, uh, I'm worried about time, so I'm going to introduce the panel all at once, and each will speak for 10 minutes, and then after everybody's finished, perhaps add a brief point if one comes up that needs clarifying. But we're really looking forward to a half an hour of your participating. I know there are people here with enormous amounts of experience. There are mics there and there, and we want very much to get rid of this old-fashioned structure with you looking at each other's backs and me and us looking at this is a hierarchical structure hierarchy is based on patriarchy patriarchy doesn't work anywhere anymore including in this room <laughs> so i hope that we can uh, at least pretend we are sitting in a circle sonia hedgepath teaches about the holocaust women's issues and world literature 
and is currently a full professor at Middle Tennessee State University. Hold up your hand, Sonia. Here. We're in order here. Uh, she will give us an overview of this anthology uh, that she co-edited. -edit, uh, Nava Semel wrote a novel, And the Rat Laughed, which is the subject of a chapter in this anthology. She's an Israeli writer of 17 books, not to mention plays, opera, libretti, TV scripts, and poetry. She's been translated into 10 languages. Her novel, Hat of Glass, is based on her own mother's testimony of sexual abuse in a concentration camp. Uh, Mama Jean Casango works to help survivors of genocidal rape from African countries and is now in Boston where she founded, as you heard, the Chalupe Foundation a decade ago to aid refugees and immigrants, including child soldiers as well as rape survivors. She will tell us about her work and ways we too can support survivors. Jessica Newworth. Hold up, okay. Uh, is a lawyer and organizer who co-founded Equality Now, a human rights organization working to end violence and discrimination against females globally. She was a consultant to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Her work included landmark decisions on rape as a form of genocide and on the culpability of media that instruct rape and genocide. She will tell us about current United Nations and legal efforts and a report that she has just completed on the Congo. Uh, and Rochelle Seidel, a political scientist who is the co-editor of this anthology. She directs Remember the Women Institute here in New York and is also a senior researcher at the Center for Women and Gender at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She will talk about the links between sexual abuse during the Holocaust and later genocides. So, Sonia, will you begin? Okay, thank you. Uh, we would all like to thank, first of all, Elizabeth Sackler for convening this panel, for hosting this. Our deepest gratitude goes out to you. And to Gloria, thank you for believing in the book, for believing in the women sitting here, and for believing in all of the people we have in the audience today. Thank you so much. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about when we began this uh, book. Rochelle Seidel at the other end of the table and I are the co-editors, and we had 16 chapter authors. When we began to work on the book Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, we did so after an important Holocaust scholar claimed that Jewish women were not raped during the Holocaust. This was in 2006 when Rochelle and I had conducted a workshop on women and the Holocaust at an educators conference in Israel. This particular preeminent scholar on the Holocaust came to our workshop and there he asserted that Jewish women were not raped during the Holocaust for where is the proof? He said, there are no documents. Both Rochelle and I knew that this could not be true. For over time, we had met scholars at conferences on the Holocaust who were attending and they were working on aspects of sexual violence against women during the Holocaust. And thus, we were able to gather their work into this particular book. The scholarship you will find in the book, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, gives various views from different perspectives, from the perspective of history, politics, literature, cinema, psychology. And the chapter authors are from many countries. They include Austria, Israel, Ukraine, Germany, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And I would like to recognize one of our chapter authors who is in the audience with us in the first row, Eva Fogelman. And Eva uh, is an author, has written a chapter on the psychology of women who were se sexually abused during the Holocaust. A very important piece of information is her contribution in the first row. Thank you, Eva. And we will hear next from Nava Semel, an acclaimed author whose work is the subject of 
Rochelle and my chapter in the book. We studied an important work by Nava called And the Rat Laughed, and also she will probably allude to another work, Hat of Glass. And I want to say as a segue that often literary works, because there's an acceptability to talking from a historical viewpoint, a political viewpoint, but when one talks about literary works or fiction as a way of accessing the Holocaust, then a big debate starts. And I would like to offer that it is fiction often that makes the topics of the Holocaust accessible to a readership. Reading something, thank you. Reading something like that makes the reader, it allows the reader to engage on the level of one-to-one, -to, -one, to participate. It's a, it's a relationship of engagement with something that sometimes is not quite as easy to do with other types of texts. So I want to say that Nava Semmel has provided this kind of avenue for readers, and I hope that you do explore her work because the literary text indeed is also a testimony. So Nava, if you would please share some of the insights that you have about writing as a fiction author, if you will. Thank you so much. First of all, uh, let me thank you all for having me. I came from Israel. Uh, I'm a daughter of survivors. My mother survives, uh, survived Auschwitz and she is one of those survivors who never spoke about her experience. And this was a taboo subject for many of my generation in Israel and maybe elsewhere as well. Uh, survivors, especially uh, mothers, uh, didn't want to share the experience because they thought about the well, uh, uh, well, well being of their children. They wanted to protect their children from the horrific past. In a way, they wanted to protect themselves, but they wanted to establish a whole new page where life could begin. And as an author, I always write about life after death, because the shadow of death was always there, but it's a choice of the survivor, uh, which I followed my mother's footsteps in choosing to look in at the half uh, full of the, the cup half full, or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. but to, to use an optimistic point of view on life and see and salute the incredible resources, inner resources of survivors in order to rehabilitate themselves, themselves without any network of uh, any, any therapeutic network, nothing what, what, uh, uh, was available at that point. So they had to depend upon their own resources. My mother only related to one story, which was about her couple in, uh, not in Auschwitz, but in another small camp. And uh, the, this woman was formerly a front whore, something which was denied for many years The Jewish women were not front whores. My mother testified that her couple was. Uh, and this woman was the guardian angel of the entire block of women in, where my mother was one of them. And she vowed to bring the, the, the inmates under her care to the end of the war, everyone will be alive. And she made a real sacrifice in order to do that. She started a sexual relationship, a lesbian relationship with the Nazi officer a woman who was in charge of the camp, but through that relationship, she saved 300 women. Mm -hmm. And this story, the real testimony of my mom became the, the basis for my writing because that's the first story that I published in 1985 in a collection called Head of Glass, and that's the title story. I even, uh, uh, since I was very, very young, and unaware of the way literature works, but in my ins by instinct, I knew that I had to put in the story the real, the true uh, details of what camp it was, which year it was. The only thing that I concealed was the true name of the couple because I thought that 
I had the gut feeling that she will never share this experience with anyone. And this is one of the reasons, I think, in my honest opinion, why the whole subject of sexual abuse during the Holocaust was a taboo, because none of the survivors shared it. Because as I said before, because survivors was looking into the future and especially taking care of their children, where family was the platform for rehabilitation, these stories of abuse were, uh, were uh, grenades, they were threatening uh, to destroy the achievement, the life achievement of these survivors. So they never shared it with anyone. Uh, for me, literature is always the way in order for me to testify, although it sounds like a contradiction in term, because literature, as Sonia said, and rightly so, is fiction. Nevertheless, I think that fiction can carry truth the seed of truth, and uh, art is always, and it is for me, a mandate for being a carrier of emotions. Uh, uh, by saying that, I, I, I don't uh, uh, minimize neither the importance of historical texts, of testimonies, of video testimonies which exists now, and I hope that everything was available now to Rochelle, to researchers like Rochelle and, and Sonia, who could seven, almost 70 years later find, find the documents or the testimonies. Nevertheless, art has a different role. And the different role is that to carry on, and especially into the future, some, something which history can be, uh, has a, a very different role and an important one, but it cannot carry, the, cannot be an emotional carrier. And that's our true mandate. In And the Red Laughed, which is fiction, I took it a step further and I explored the, uh, the journey and the quest, the inner quest of a, ch of a girl, a little girl, who was sexually abused and raped by her keepers, but later was saved by a Roman Catholic priest in Poland in 1943. It is a fictional tale, but uh, when, when I was asked, Will, did you base your story upon a real testimony? I said, no, I did not, but I assume and I expect that this happened to someone. And following the publication, the book was published in Israel in 2001, 10 people approached me. <laughs> Two thirds were women, one third were men, who told me that they had a similar life experience and they said, I never shared it with anyone, and I never will. And they thanked me for, uh, not me, I didn't, I mean, I was, I felt blessed that I could be their corridors or there to voice their untold uh, story. I just finished, before I came here, I spoke with my mom, who is 89 years old. She will celebrate her 90th birthday in October. She's alert, she's smart, and, and she gave me uh, something which is among the Jewish people is called the blessing of the way. And I carry this bless, blessing of, of, of the way. Uh, I said I'm going to carry it here, to, not only to the participants of this panel, but to the entire audience, because I, I am blessed with a mom who showed me the way and who showed me how, what are the incredible resources, emotional, spiritual, and also physical, but that's the third on the line. Uh, what are the inner resources of, of a survivor who can create a, a whole dimensional life spectrum for herself and create a family and, and have a, see a fourth generation? And uh, this is my salute and her salute to life. Thank you. Be uh, be be before Mama Jean begins, especially someone named Mama Jean, I noticed that a woman with a baby left because the baby was crying. Could someone come tell her to come back in? 
I mean, we put up with, with jet planes and all kinds of sounds that are much less important and moving than the cry of a baby. Tell her to come back. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank you for being me here. Uh, I prefer to be called Mama Jeanne. My name is Jeanne Kasongo Ngondo. And Kasongo is my father's name. Ngo, my name is Ngondo. Uh, that's in Africa, we, we called uh, by our grandma name. My, our... Okay, uh, with Africa, uh, we are named by our grandma name, and uh, it's why. But my name is Jeanne Kasongo Ngondo. Uh, I became Mama Jeanne from two, uh, 19, 1990. When I start to have those uh, children called uh, street children, uh, it was uh, in our neighborhood. Some ch uh, children who don't like uh, I would call them indisciplinary children, and uh, they don't go to, uh, want to go to school and they play home. And I bring them to my home and talk to them, and they start calling me Mama Jean. Some of them go back home and go to, uh, to school. That is, that was, uh, it was e easy, and uh, we start like this until 1999. We start to have those uh, uh, who are displaced. That is in K Congo, in Kinshasa. Who are displaced, some former child soldiers, some uh, uh, raped women who are displaced and uh, it become uh, a kind of not uh, easy for us because those ones seeing the, all of those atrocity, uh, it was very, very hard for, for me to st uh, still have them at home and talk to them, you know, uh, sometimes in the night they wake up and uh, they start to cry and it was very... Uh, uh, scary for me and uh, I start the uh, Shalup Foundation who have one uh, shelter to take care of them. We, uh, we find some social worker and uh, uh, some uh, 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 doctors to help us to take care of all of them. And when I came here and uh, my children say, you are here now, it's good for you to start the same organization. You are going to be well equipped to help all of those who has, uh, uh, you left behind in Congo. Shalup means lifeboat. I think those who speak French, we know that uh, is the big bo boat is sinking. There is the small uh, boat. They call them Shalup. It's C-H-A-L-E. O U P E, Shalup. But for me, it's S H A L U P E E U P E. It's uh, come from my father's and mother's name. My father's name is uh, Jean Jean Kasongo Shamibanga. Shamibanga is father of ivory because it was uh, an artist is doing ivory. And uh, my mother's name is Lupetu. It's a uh, treasure. Treasury, yeah, okay. And I took Sha and Loop, and I did Shaloop. It's the same. We have, uh, we are there to help those who are, uh, who are thinking. It's why uh, we have Shalup Foundation in Congo. We have three uh, sh shelter in Kinshasa, and uh, in Bukavu, working with uh, uh, forty women. I call them the social worker because it's, it's those one who go uh, to the uh, field to take care of those women who fear to come out and to talk about the situation. Uh, as uh, uh, she taught here, I forget your name, Nava. sir. Nava said there, uh, the rape is not uh, a good thing to say, um, especially in Africa, to go to say, I am a raped woman you are automatically rejected. And if you have children, that is become very hard for you to be accepted even by your, uh, your uh, family members. I have my board there. I call this board the uh, Congolese woman face. You can fee, uh, see 
all those phase. There are some women have uh, uh, their lips cut because they, uh, they go to uh, justice and bring all of their, uh, those uh, uh, perpetrator, perpetrators uh, to justice. And they cut the one who uh, uh, remind come back and cut their lips for them not to talk. You see, there is a uh, girl. She was nine year old. Uh, she was raped by the UN uh, people. Her baby is white, and uh, many many of those things. You can see there are some gorilla there. We, are, we have a big park, Kauzbiega. There is many, many gorilla. We have to take care of them. When five of them were killed in 2006, world talks about it. And they give five million to those, uh, the conservator of uh, this park to take care and to, uh, for the gorilla be safe. But they were, this, in the same time, they killed five men too, and they do the same thing to those men. Nobody talking about it. The rape in Congo, I think it's for humiliated people. It's for uh, extension of this race. All of us know that uh, in Congo, we know that Congo is the richest country in the world, but it, the country where the people are the poorest in the world. For a child go to school, it's for three dollars only. The rape in Congo and the war in Congo, everybody talk about it, but there is no action. Everywhere I go, I said it's good to talk about the rape uh, of Congolese women, of uh, the rape in Africa. It's good to give uh, some uh, 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 medication and uh, five dollars, ten dollars to to uh, those who was raped. That's good, but the good things is to stop the cause of this rape. We can go uh, over and over, help them, but if the cause still those uh, rape uh, raper still there, they still going and do it. They are not br uh, bring injustice the rape is going to steal. The good thing is to stop the cause of the rape because the rape is a consequence. For uh, people to have all we have, those cult and everything, they want, it to be, uh, they want to bought it illegally. To have it illegally, it's the, 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 the good thing to bring weapon in Africa and give it to our people to kill each other and to let them have whatever they want. Congo is a good country. It's an open country. I think if each one of you want to, uh, to, do, uh, 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 to have uh, those uh, natural resources and coming by the big uh, door of Congo, I think you can have it. Why to kill? Why to rape? Why to destroy life in Congo? Please come by the, the door, Congo, and take whatever you want to Congolese. Don't go by our neighborhood country and go and kill and destroy. And uh, I don't know how to, uh, to, to say it. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I just uh, the, uh, say it briefly. We have many uh, women who they were working until day for five dollars for her to go over the field to help those who can't go out. It's very hard for us to do it by ourselves. Congolese people need world to turn their eyes to Congo. I think some of you have seen the uh, greatest silence and every, all of those uh, movies, documentary in Congo. Why it's not stopped? Why? I think you know that the first uh, Holocaust or homicide or genocide in the world it was in Congo with the King Lopo II. In 
1912. He killed 10 million of Congolese, cut the end and everything for the robber. And again, for those natural resources, they kill again, they raped and they destroy life in Congo. Which, which as Congolese say, those, uh, all of those uh, uh, natural resources, is it a cost for Congo or what? Or what? Because all of those uh, uh, kill and rape and uh, those uh, criminality in Congo is uh, uh, about those uh, uh, natural resources. Okay, I think my time is up. Uh, <laughs> We have our sign, uh, sign up list there if you want to sign and to know uh, more about us. We have a sign up list there. Please, thank you. Good afternoon. I want to start by, by, by thanking Elizabeth Sackler and Gloria and, and saying what an honor it is to be on this panel and, uh, and thank the authors of this book. Um, because I, uh, someone who's for 25 years been in the women's movement studying these issues of sexual violence and war, each time we have uh, armed conflict, we have sexual violence, I think we always knew that the sexual violence was there, but we could never find it. And about 10 years ago, I actually tried to look around um, to see if we could get some information on what had happened uh, during the Holocaust. And I talked to a few Holocaust scholars and a few women who were um, in the academic movement of the Holocaust, and they basically said, we can't talk about this, it's a taboo subject. So I'm just so pleased now that this book has, uh, has opened up this, this issue. Um, and, and what I wanna talk about today is truth, outrage, and institutional response, uh, and use that as a framework to uh, talk a little bit about what the U UN is doing and it seems a good time because we just heard a lot of truth about what's happening in Congo and, and, and you just feel a sense of outrage. And then the question is, what, what is the institutional response? Um, is it effective? And outrage over the rapes in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina in the early 90s certainly led the way to the creation of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, which was really a, a first since Nuremberg in the Tokyo tribunals of World War II. Uh, Equality Now, and I think it was 1993, had done a kind of most wanted poster campaign for Radovan Karadzic, who was the mastermind of the systematic rape of Muslim women. Um, and at that time, even just a year or two before, I don't think we had any idea that there would be an international criminal tribunal and that he would actually end up being arrested and currently uh, facing trial uh, before it. Um, so a lot has happened and when you step back it, it really looks like tremendous progress. But up close it's actually been very problematic and many of the women, in particular survivors trying to seek justice, uh, I think have often suffered a secondary wave of, of vic victimization um, and, so, and, and, and not been able to secure the justice that they, that they sought. And, and the outcry in Rwanda similarly um, moved the international community to create the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda uh, after 1994. And certainly so much rape was documented at that time, I think there were estimates that half of the women in Kigali had been raped. Um, so it was very well known. But then once the tribunal was established in the, in the early cases, there were no charges of rape in any of the indictments. And that's where I think we saw the, the institution breaking down. Because I was in the tribunal for a short time working on the first case, I just thought as a little example, I'll tell you how that came up. Because the Akiyesu case was the first case of the tribunal of a mayor in a small town in Rwanda. And he was charged with genocide and other crimes. Um, but there was no mention of rape in the indictment. And during the trial itself, one of the witnesses testified about uh, hiding in a tree and looking down and seeing her daughter raped by the defendant on trial. And that moment came and went in the courtroom. No prosecutor didn't say anything about it. The defense uh, lawyers didn't say anything about it. So at the end, which is when the judges have a chance to ask questions, one of the judges uh, whom I worked for, Navi Pillay, the one woman on the tribunal at that time, asked about it. 
and got more information from the witness on the record about that rape. And, and the other judges also jumped in and asked about that rape. So once that incident took place in the court, then there was a campaign launched to amend the indictment. But it's so much more difficult. I don't want to be a boring lawyer, but, but when, you, um, when you don't charge something the first time and then you have to go back and put it in, all kinds of questions come up, like why didn't the witnesses talk about it the first time? And aren't they just making it up because you're asking for that information? So, it was really uh, much more difficult, and there were many reasons that it hadn't come up. Many, uh, most of the investigators were, were men who didn't even ask about it. Some of the women who, when they were interviewed the second time, I mean, this is what I was told uh, informally by, by those who did the interviews, uh, that they had mentioned it, but that the prosecutors and investigators had said they weren't really interested in that part of the story. So um, that's how it never got into the indictment. But because all of that did happen, it really led to a very historic judgment, I think, that, um, that recognized that rape can be a form of genocide, that it just destroys not only women, but communities and societies as a whole. Uh, so we have come a long way now. We have, since those two ad hoc tribunals, a number of other tribunals for different countries, and also the International Criminal Court, which was established, which is a more permanent court that, uh, that really has a tremendous potential. But of course, the same issues are coming up with regard to sexual violence, and even some of the indictments uh, in the Congolese cases don't have uh, rape charged, and it's the same problems with investigators and prosecutors. One good advance that I would point out is an advocacy achievement of the, of the women's movement was a provision in the statute of the International Criminal Court on gender representation, because the UN always has regional representation, and that's, that's no problem, but they had never had gender representation. So now there's a minimum number of women required to be judges on the International Criminal Court, and I think that makes a big difference. Um, it was a big battle, as you can imagine. But international tribunals and those types of prosecutions are really only one avenue uh, of accountability in the UN, not the only one, and in some ways maybe not the best one because each case costs millions of dollars, it takes years and years, and it's a very cumbersome process. Um, and there are other political processes in the UN specifically relating to the Security Council that I think can also play a very important role in the campaign to end armed uh, conflict and rape and armed conflict. Um, you may be familiar with uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, which was adopted in 2000 and recognizes the important role of women uh, in the maintenance of peace and security. And that was 10 years ago. We just had the 10th year anniversary of that resolution. And I think a lot of question about are women really being given the role that it was recognized they should have, uh, not just for the sake of having women, but for the contribution that they could bring to maintaining peace and security. But I think often we don't see women at the table, um, or very few. So more recently, there's been a kind of, I would say, an acceleration uh, in energy around this issue at the UN. And a resolution was passed in 2008, adopted, uh, introduced by the United States in the Security Council, which is Resolution 1820, that focused more specifically on sexual violence and really recognized that sexual violence threatens peace and security, which is very, very significant because it brings it into the sort of jurisdiction of the Security Council. Uh, and, and means there are many possibilities for, for action at the international level. Uh, but all the resolution did in 2008 was call for a report. So a year later, there was a report, and there was more and more momentum growing, and the next resolution passed when that report was introduced in the Security Council was Resolution 1888 in 2009, which created a special representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence and conflict at a very high level of an undersecretary general. So it called on the Secretary General to really appoint someone to look at this uh, all the time, not just once a year, and, and to continue doing the report and a number of other measures uh, to try to address this issue. So a special representative was appointed uh, just about a year ago, Margaret Wallström from Sweden. And I have to say, she's done a tremendous amount traveling around the world, going to conflict zones. She's been to the Congo a number of times. When there were uh, reports of mass rape in Wali Kali, not so long ago, she went there and has, I think, internally as well as externally, really tried to, to, to make this issue a much higher priority. Um, and she, in turn, when the next report came up, managed to get um, a resolution passed 1960, Security Council Resolution 1960, 
which is a, a further step forward because it calls for, in this annual report, a listing at the end of the report of suspected perpetrators, which is a process that's been used very effectively by the, um, by the UN mechanism that deals with children in armed conflict. So uh, when you actually can name people in the Security Council, it gives you a tremendous amount of political leverage on those people. They do not like to be named in those reports, and it, it has created for children in armed conflict a way of forcing a dialogue. So now there's the same possibility for sexual violence, and I know that uh, the special representative recently was able to meet with President Kabila in the Congo, which was something she had not been able to do before. So I think the pressure is building. Um, and as you may know also, this is a very important year for the UN in terms of the launch of UN Women, which is the culmination of many years of effort to consolidate and enhance the institutional framework uh, within the UN, bringing together many different agencies that were not working, uh, were not connected to, to work on women and, and higher levels of, of representation and a bigger budget. I think the idea being that we want a UNICEF type of thing for women, and, and the budget of UNICEF is, I don't know, about a billion dollars, and I think that that's the kind of scale that I think they're looking at in the UN, which could create a real presence on the ground uh, for women, uh, not only to help survivors, but to prevent further atrocities through the empowerment of women, which is the very broad mandate of UN women. Um, now, the project that Gloria mentioned uh, that I just finished was with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and that is currently Navi Pillay, who was the judge in the Akayesu case and has a long history of interest in and concern over violence against women. So her focus is very much on survivors and, and the victim perspective of justice, and she last year appointed a high-level panel that was chaired by her deputy that traveled across the Congo for several weeks conducting hearings directly with victims and survivors of sexual violence uh, ranging in age from three years old to 61 years old um, and all, all different kinds of, of situations focusing not just on what happened to them because the stories of women in Congo are very well known. We hear them again and again. And the question of this panel was, what happened since then? What, what assistance have you gotten? Has it been effective? What, what's your sense of justice? What, what, what do you need now? And um, not surprisingly, one of the findings of the panel is that the biggest problem for many women, is, is maybe in some cases even greater than the consequences of the rape itself, is the stigma that they faced as a result of the rape and the fact that when their husbands found out they were raped, they were thrown out of their house, they lost their source of income, um, their children are, are homeless, many of them have contracted HIV AIDS, and their number one concern is not even for their own health, but just what will happen to my children when I die, and, and where will they be? And again, even though so many of these women have tremendous physical problems and psychological needs, the two things they most wanted were peace in the country and education for their children. And as Mama Jean mentioned, it's $3 a month to send a child to school. But you see that they just don't get this kind of uh, support, and yet billions of dollars are going into the country to help victims of sexual violence. So that's the kind of, I think, truth and information that we need to start looking at that the more we, the more I learn about it certainly, and I'm sure the more you would learn about it, it just generates a, an outrage that we have to channel back into the institutional responses because I think um, there's so many ways in which these efforts to help women end up becoming more disempowering than empowering. And, in terms of justice, I'll just end by giving you one story uh, from a small village called Songomboyo, where we visited. There had been a mass rape in 2005, and there was actually, unusually, a legal case following that in 2006, where soldiers were tried and convicted. 29 women got judgments of $5,000 each as a compensation for what they had suffered. But then the perpetrators escaped, and the damages were never paid by the state. So these women are so frustrated. They went through all the ordeal of the trial. They spoke about what happened to them. But now they're the laughing stock of the village. And very recently, there was a similar type of mass rape in a small town called Fizi. And just a few weeks ago, a similar, very successful conviction. But of course, the concern is that the same thing will happen. So, um, so the women that we talked to, uh, I think, really all felt they're not getting the support they need. That's one of the main findings of the report and a recommendation that the UN set up a reparations fund where funds will go directly to women, which is 
not going to be an easy thing for anyone who knows the UN, but I think truth is the start and the end of the cycle of accountability, and I just want to say one last word about the um, Holocaust, because uh, as you may know, just a few years ago, maybe five or ten years ago, the comfort women in Korea started to speak out, and one woman went on TV in her very late, uh, I think, 70s, and, and within a few years, there was a whole movement of these women, and I think they've made such a contribution, not only to history, but to an immediate sense of accountability in their efforts to get apologies and hold the Japanese government accountable. So I'm so encouraged by this book, and I hope that it, you know, it's not too late and that in some way we can really try to also make that a movement for accountability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to uh, Elizabeth Sackler, to Gloria Steinem, to all of the panelists. And it's my job to try and tie together the story of uh, sexual violation and genocide during the Holocaust and later genocides. It seems to me obvious that uh, throughout history, uh, you can read it in the Bible, you can read it anywhere, there's always been uh, rape and sexual violence when there has been war and conflict. I, it's a little bit surprising, and we can discuss it in, in the questions perhaps, and uh, not that we have definitive answers, how any, anybody could possibly think that despite all these thousands of years of history, including now, that uh, couldn't have happened during the Holocaust. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but this was some of the resistance that we received from some people that we think should have known better. Now, there are some differences and there are some similarities between what is going on now in Africa and other places and what went on during the Holocaust. And uh, we need to consider them because the question is, can we use the lessons of the Holocaust to understand better what's going on today and perhaps, if possible, prevent other terrible sexual violence and rape in, in any other genocides? Uh, we can discuss this. Uh, I, again, I don't have a definitive answer, but I think it certainly helps to have m exposed earlier history to make it uh, better to understand what, what's happening now. Uh, this, um, this particular, uh, talk, when, when Mama Jean said something, it reminded me of something I really forgot, and I think I blocked it out of my mind. But I think you said that sometimes the women were like physically made unable to talk after they were raped. Mm -hmm. And I remember a survivor telling me when I did my research on, on uh, Ravensbrück for that book that she was a, a teenage girl and it was her job to bring coffee to uh, morning, not real coffee, but uh, something somewhat like coffee, to uh, a particular building in Ravensbrück where it was a special kind of lockdown place. And she was carrying from one side and someone was carrying from another side. And she walked into this place. She asked me if I ever found, heard this from anyone else. I never did, but I have no reason not to believe her. She said that all of the young women, girls in that building had had their tongues cut out. And they were trying to talk. I thought of this while you were talking because I really haven't thought about it for years. And that they were just gesturing to show where they had been abused and they couldn't talk and they were trying to tell her the story. And I don't believe this woman is any longer living, but every time I saw her, she kept saying to me, did you ever find more evidence? And I checked with people at the memorial. There is no other evidence but her own testimony. But I, I believe this happened, and it so much reminded me of, of exactly what you just said. Uh, there are always uh, similarities. Uh, the, the shame is a similarity, the not wanting to talk, the uh, perhaps being shunned by the community or worrying you'd be shunned by the community. This happened after the Holocaust, we know that. Um, Eva Fogelman, who's sitting in the front row, who did a, a chapter on psychology, she, she, she said that uh, many of the children of survivors, if their mothers are, were beautiful women, they would always kind of wonder and have some kind of fantasy. Did their mother have to provide some sexual favors in order to survive, or how did she survive? In Israel, I know a, a personal friend that w was uh, 
the family were, were uh, Israeli, and then the survivor came, and the young man wanted to marry the survivor, and his parents were concerned that she was, quote, unquote, damaged goods. So this, this shame is, is always related. There's a difference. Uh, during the Holocaust, rape was not used as a, quote, unquote, tool of war, the way it has been used in later um, later genocides, because there was a Nazi law, the Rassenschande law, which was against sexual relations between um, Nazis and uh, Jews or other unworthy to be with uh, the master race, so that uh, it was against the law. So it was not a tool of war. It was nevertheless a tool of power, a tool of humiliation, which is what rape is. And we know that women were raped in camps. We know they were used as sexual slaves. Um, they were not in official bordellos such as in Auschwitz because exactly of this law, but they were on the front. They were taken into a Nazi's home and used, and I have testimony of that, of a woman that, that had to be a Jewish woman who had to be naked in the home of a Nazi uh, in, in Eastern Poland. So. Uh, there, there, be, beside this difference, there are certainly uh, similarities. Uh, we've, we've learned a lot because we were working on women and, uh, during the Holocaust. In our introduction, we have a little bit about later uh, genocides. I mean, it's obvious to us that we know that there's got to be a relationship or, or it's almost, you know, beside the historical relevance, why talk about it if we can't tie it together? Uh, so, so we did that there, but after the book came out, you always learn things the way Nava said, after her book came out, 10 people came forward. So after the book came out, we began a lot of it thanks to Gloria tying it together. And also we went to the uh, Salzburg Global Seminars last summer where they had a special week-long conference on uh, genocide and they hadn't uh, bothered including the gender question and then we were invited and we were able to integrate that and we met there many people talking about later genocides from Bosnia, from Africa and it was really important to our understanding and to our work. And as, uh, one last thing and I'm going to finish and that was Jessica talked a lot about the United Nations and uh, finally unlike Nuremberg where there was not uh, rape or any sexual violation was not considered a crime against humanity, now at least the UN has, has this as on the books that it is. So I think that's very helpful, this, this uh, uh, women's rights were not human rights for Nuremberg, a, a, as uh, Dr. Sackler said that they are, and now at least they are on paper, and we think that's very important. Uh, but the United Nations on Holocaust Remembrance Day this year, which was January 27, had as their theme, because they've had, a, they've had a Holocaust Remembrance Day for the last four years, and every year they have a theme, and this year it was women, something like Profiles of Courage, that wasn't quite the name. And even though Sonia and I wrote and tried and talked and wrote an op-ed piece, which was outside, which was in, in one of the papers, we, why, we, why aren't you including, if you're, if you're having women as the theme for Holocaust Remembrance Day, why aren't you recognizing sexual violence against women? And it was absolutely off the agenda. So we have a lot of work to do, and I think I'm going to end right there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And while people are lining up at the mics, which are here and here, I just want to seed the discussion. I know it's hard to hear all of this, and we want to know what we can do. So I will say one thing that we're thinking about, which is trying to network in the way that Women to Women International does rape survivors in countries that are relatively well off economically with rape survivors in other countries so that there is a personal connection on the grounds that this Ex connection of experience is very important and that as in women to women one might be able to supply school fees or small monthly checks or you know something that we can do from the bottom up while we also struggle from the top down and 
And I just want to say that there's another important uh, book uh, called At the Dark End of the Street by Danielle McGuire, which is an entire retelling of the civil rights movement as rooted in the massive sexual abuse of black women. Uh, and that the reason Rosa Parks um, was activated was specifically on a rape case. And this story also has not been told for many of the same reasons. For instance, in that book, I learned that Fannie Lou Hamer, whom I knew and worked with and had been sterilized, uh, in fact, in a Mississippi hospital without her knowledge in an operation so common it was known as the Mississippi appendectomy, had a grandmother who bore 23 children, 20 from rape. And the difference, what was the difference between her grandmother and her? They did, in Fannie Lou's era, they had mechanized field labor. In her grandmother's era, they didn't. They needed more field labor. So, I mean, you know, I think we need to look at the deep reproductive politics of this. It's because women's bodies are the means of reproduction that we're in this jam in the first place. Uh, and to some extent, if you do genocide, you have to put the you have to put the right sperm in the wrong wombs, if you see what I mean, in order to accomplish genocide. So I think, you know, there, 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 as Rochelle says, there are all kinds of, of, of reasons here, but the reasons end up with gender, even when they are uh, raping boys and men, because making them into women is the most shameful thing mm -hmm. that can possibly happen to them. So I think if we look at this politics and we understand that traditionally what happens to men is called politics, what happens to women is called culture, but it's all politics. <laughs> it's all about power and, and, and reproduction. So can we start with this side? We all thank you so much. This is a panel discussion that we all needed to be at. Many of us got here by accident. We just happened to be here. Some of us got here because we wanted to be here. But we're all here, and we owe a debt of obligation to ourselves to pay attention to our neighbors. And I'll just tell a brief story. I go to the health club, and we all get naked, and then I get to see the numbers on the arms. And then I look for people around me, and I wonder, who has a survivor of this war, and who's a survivor of that war? You're sitting in the the pool and you don't even know who you're in the pool with. And I did find a Holocaust survivor who t told stories about, to the, to the Shoah Commission, and I wanted a story because I'm collecting for myself to write down and, and to be alive, because if you're, if you're not interested in what's going on, maybe they say we're gossiping. Yes, we're gossiping. I think you said that many years ago. Gossiping, that's what we do. We talk to each other. Try to stop us. So keep talking to each other, keep buying each other's books, keep writing those books, and encouraging us not to shut up. Do you, would you want to, wait, wait, wait. Do you want to say, if you're collecting stories, do you want, you don't have to, but do you want to say your name in case there are people in this audience? I'm sorry, they asked me to say your name. It's up to you. I'm going to stay after. I am Babette Albin. I collect stories. I listen and I write them down. Thank All you. Right. All right, so she'll be in the back of the room afterwards. This is an organizing session here. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Kelly. I work for the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And I wanted to ask a question about the fact that even though rape is often a feature of war, it's not an inevitable feature of war. It doesn't have to happen. And I think a lot of the traditional viewpoints have been, it's just a byproduct. There's nothing you can do about it. And I think panels like this really illuminate the fact that it can be a tool of war. It's not just a byproduct, but it doesn't have to be inevitable. And I was wondering if I could ask the panel to reflect on that, that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anybody want to reflect on the, the fact that it's not inevitable and not natural? Yeah. Jessica. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, historically there's been absolute impunity for rape. So I don't think we really know. Um, I mean, I, obviously, I don't think at all that rape is inevitable, but I think that there has to be accountability. And what you have is the exact opposite. You have commanders ordering people to rape. That's what we saw in Bosnia. Even in this Fizi case just a few weeks ago that I mentioned, what happened was there was an incident in a village. A soldier got attacked. 
And the commander then ordered his men to go into the village and kill, rape, and loot. So I think, um, you know, there, there's absolutely no reason that it should be inevitable. But in order to move towards that state, we, we have to have more accountability. Yes, I, I think we, what we know is that the more equal men and women are in a society, the less the rape. Uh, so I think we've absorbed that rape is about violence in this country, that, that rape is about violence, not sex. But what interest has fascinated me is reading the accounts of Europeans who arrived here, and among the things they were most shocked by was that there was no rape. They say, Benjamin Franklin, all kinds of people remarked, they said, even these savages don't rape the, even prisoners. <laughs> you know, they could, because they were societies in which the paradigm was the circle, not a hierarchy, there was relative, uh, relatively equal power. Uh, they were also shocked that people didn't beat their children. This is against religion, you have to beat the devil out of your children. So it gave me faith, because I think one of the most difficult things is the idea that it is inevitable, it is natural, and somehow reading about original cultures that were more about balance, where perhaps it wasn't totally unknown, because in the Iroquois Confederacy, one of the requirements for, for leadership is that you have not, uh, they have a word for it, it doesn't say rape, but that you have not insulted a woman, I guess. I thought, there goes Congress, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But um, there's, the, there's no reason uh, to believe, looking at original cultures, that it is inevitable or part of human nature. And this is actually ancillary to that, but in one of our chapters, the chapter author, Robert Sommer, writes about brothels, and he talks about the brothel in Auschwitz and why Himmler originally had the brothels established, and one of the reasons was that men have their needs. So that's also worth investigating. And it was also a reward. The brothels were a reward for doing work so that the men, if they, uh, if they produced in, if were in their slave labor, they got a reward so that a male concentration camp prisoner could be rewarded by having a forced woman prostitute uh, it, it, it's uh, quite a situation. So, so the, the, the woman is forced to be a prostitute so that the man could have his needs met, as, mm -hmm. as Sonia said, and also as a reward for his doing good work. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, to increase productivity, work product. Yes. And, and this is part of the reason, the complicity is part of the reason the story didn't get told. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Hi, my name is Faith Steinberg. I had a grandmother, an aunt, and two baby cousins in the Holocaust. I find that, um, that a lot of the younger people don't know anything about the Holocaust. And even the use of the word Holocaust is looked upon askance. Uh, they resent it, um, uh, many of the people that I have spoken to. And, and I, I looked up the origins of the word Holocaust, and it has to do with sacrifice by fire. And I think that's what distinguishes what happened in the Holocaust um, be, between, they were all horrible, but it, it, it distinguishes it from your ordinary everyday genocide, which we have been witnessing talk about um, humans in humanity towards humans, to paraphrase. But what I wonder is why we haven't, um, why we haven't Can't hear. had Can't hear. Like, the African Americans, <laughs> why we haven't had what the African Americans have, a program on the Holocaust because there seems to be a forgetting, and even I, I find that people even resent the use of, of, of the word Holocaust. Somebody said to me, which, uh, which Holocaust? So um, I, I would like to see that people like yourselves, and I have to thank you for this wonderful uh, lecture, with co connections, I would love to see a program 
so that we don't forget um, about, it's important for us to remember these and hopefully one day humans will wake up and, and really be human. So we should remember these things for that reason. Thank you. Thank you. Do either of you want to address that? No. Well, I mean, we, I don't know what kind of program that you mean. I mean, we have a U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum on the mall in Washington. Every major city in the United States has a Holocaust Museum now. And there are programs in schools, so... I, I, I do want to say two I sentences. Know. And I really appreciate you saying that you like that we're making connections. In 1993, Judy Chicago, as you know, with her husband, Donald Woodman, uh, did an exhibit called uh, the Holocaust, Pro Holocaust Project from Darkness into Light. And some of the criticism that received was that it made connections to other genocides, perhaps at that time, and we know the visionary that Judy Chicago is, that the time wasn't right. A lot of people couldn't get behind that. And I think that it's time to look at her project again and look at it from our eyes today. I think that would be really useful because it helps us to make the connections. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this panel. My name is Richard Oberstein. Um, I'm a physical therapist, but my interest in this subject goes back many years. Um, in listening to your panel, I have a couple of things I wanted to state. First of all, there's not that many men here, obviously. So there's a, a dire need for this subject, not, I mean, just, not just the Holocaust, but sexual violence, has to be taught to, to people, I mean, to, to men. Um, men, men obviously. <laughs> no, I'm saying people. No, but I mean, the point is that it's good that all of you are here, but there's another part that needs to be here, another, another section. <laughs> so I mean, this has to be part of the curriculum internationally. My second question is for Eva Fogelman. I don't know who she is, but she's here? Yes. Okay, this is my question. When Mama Jean was speaking, I was struck by the fact that the stigma attached to women who are raped is so counterproductive that it seems insane that a so any society, whether it be after the Holocaust or in the Congo, how does, maybe for Eva Fogelman, how does human nature occur that you have a rape which is caused not by the woman, then becomes a stigma to the woman. I, don't, I do not understand the psychology of that. Eva, do you want to go to that mic? Uh, there is this uh, well-known phenomenon called blaming the victim. <laughs> and uh, I think that you know, we see that in rape cases, uh, in the American court system, and uh, we, we see that, you know, everywhere, certainly even in the, uh, you know, in the tribunals. I mean, when even during the Holocaust, if anyone would say, uh, you know, I had to, uh, you know, give myself over uh, so that I can feed my child, uh, right away uh, it was the woman's fault that she had to, whether she, whether she was raped because she was doing it, because she was trying to save a life, or whether, you know, she was, uh, whether she was just raped, um, you know, uh, as a circumstance, uh, she is still blamed, you know, well, what did you do? And uh, it's a very unfortunate mm -hmm. uh, thing that is a very natural instinct. And if you take, if you understand even Hannah Arendt's work, all the early work on you know, the Holocaust, it was blaming the victims. So whether they were rape victims or whether they were killed, it was their fault. And uh, that unfortunately continues to, to this very day. Mm -hmm. But does this, go back, does this go back to any you know, hundreds of years, I mean, or is this well, something? Well, it's just, this, this is a, a human instinct. It's a human instinct. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And one has to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it even is as basic as, you know, if, if somebody had an accident and they fell, 
right away you say, oh, you know, why did they trip? If it was a woman, was she wearing high heels? She tripped because she was wearing high heels. Mm -hmm. Never mind that, you know, that the streets in New York are full of uh, potholes. <laughs> Well, it, 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 well, I have so to say, it's I don't something, to, it's yeah. something okay. that we have, when we hear these testimonies, we have to be aware ourselves of that very instinct and stop it. And we have to make others aware of that instinct. And that is, I think, part of mm -hmm. our job in making people aware that women who got raped did not want to get raped. That's why I say it should be... There should be training internationally on education on this mm. whole subject because it's mm. really lacking. But I thank you for the panel. I think thank you. I think it's a fantasy of control, don't you? Because you see someone who something bad has happened to them, and you think, well, if I just don't do the one thing that they did, then I'll be safe. But I do think added to that in the case of women is are the politics of reproduction, the cult of virginity, the idea that the means of production can only belong to one. Uh, one male, uh, that that's the only way they'll be able to own their children. You know, it, it goes, I think, much deeper in this case. Uh, now, this, yes. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the panel. Um, I think this is connected to what was just said. Um, I've, my name's Susan Stein, and I've been working for the last few years um, with the diaries and letters of Eddie Hillisum, the Dutch diarist. Um, who really, I think, speaks to resistance, resilience, and survival. Um, in, in my research, um, I've, she really kind of just looks at things head on. I mean, that's her power, is looking at the truth, um, which we're celebrating today. Um, in, in researching her, um, I read the diaries of Philip Mechanicus, who was also at the Vestibork transit camp. And he really takes on the Jewish council in his diary and writes um, quite a bit about kind of one of those leaders, Schlesinger, who made use of many Jewish women um, to get their families off the lists. So I just wondered, I'm looking forward although that's an odd way of saying it, to reading your book. Um, but, I mean, in this talk about power, um, and, I mean, I understand the Nazis had these laws. I mean, what Eddie Hillison does, which is kind of remarkable, she refuses to demonize her perpetrators because she is looking at kind of the complexity of all of it and that genocide, in her mind, is inevitable and that the idea is about human nature and power. And the... Nazis were kind of brilliant in kind of getting many people to do their work for them. And we see in, um, in people that this is what happens. And then in that transit camp, we see it among. So I don't know if that comes up in your book or not. But yeah. Thank you. You want me to answer? Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, in our book as well, and in history as well, the Nazis were not the only uh, people, men, who raped women. There were also uh, uh, other, uh, uh, some of their uh, allies in, who were uh, guards in concentration camps. There were uh, people who were supposed to be protecting uh, women or children in hiding, which is, is uh, the basis of Nava's book and the Rat Laugh. And there were, unfortunately, Jewish men in power in some places that used their power and also either raped women or we, we know of cases in the book that they gave uh, some of the pretty girls in the town to the Nazis for the promise that the town wouldn't be deported to a death camp, which you know, lasted about two days, and then the town was deported to the death camp. So unfortunately, you're right. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. I think we sometimes uh, have to also, maybe because I'm an artist, into the very core of human nature. And I think it goes down to the point, to the bottom line, where someone has to choose between right and wrong. 
And yes, there is politi- uh, rape and sexual abuse could be a political power and it's part of genocide or maybe part of history. But it comes to a point where a man stands in front of his own conscience and I think that there is an instinct between choosing between right and wrong and uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, sometimes by even explaining we give a sort of, I'll be very, very uh, and I apologize for my lack of English because it's not my native tongue. I wouldn't like to give any excuse for anybody because when it goes down to the bottom line, is a man has to make a choice. A human being has to make a choice. No, thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Marcy Chilowitz, and um, I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much for all of your knowledge. This is the first type of meeting on the subject um, that I've attended. Um, I'm here in a personal nature. Um, I myself have been a victim here in the United States. Um, Rape, on a vulnerable side, I was coerced many times by those in the United States, both corporate and in power, Um, It's due to discrimination, by the way. I am a Jewish female who is also a Christian. And I faced a lot of discrimination over an 11-year period for my beliefs. So sexual violence is really one issue here that I have to deal with. Um, Here is my question. I tried reaching out to Amnesty International to no avail. I really, this is, this is my first time reaching out at all or even speaking. I would like to know, my first issue is confidentiality and trust. Um, I don't have that because it's within the United States and I fear that I will not be allowed to speak out because in the past I have not been. What I would like to do is I'd like to find out how I can handle it, who I can go to, and then how I can get involved. I don't believe that I'm, I don't know if the involvement comes with handling it together, or do I need to handle it first and then get involved? Like you're up there now, you have all been through your situations and you are professionals having survived and known survivors. So my goal is that I would like to get involved. Um, The issue here is, and most importantly, it involves my perpetrators, men and women. Mm -hmm. I'd like to find out who I can reach out to and um, right now at this particular time, I have ended male relationships because it's been really horrific for me. Um, Also female relationships because the discrimination has gotten really, really bad and I'm really on a very untrusting level now. Mm -hmm. Where can I get help? Okay, Jessica, do you wanna address that? Because Jessica really founded 20 years ago Equality Now because the human rights committee, community did not address women's rights. You know, they were sort of essentially saying, well, that's cultural, that's inevitable, we're addressing political injustices, which caused the founding of Equality Now. But can you, do you, do you want to address this? I can try. I mean, I, I think one part of what you were asking is, you know, um, I guess kind of healing yourself and also taking on advocacy. I think that's really very different for different people. Some people, the advocacy becomes part of their healing. And for other people, it just reopens a lot of issues and it just is very painful. So I, I and that's not my expertise, you know, I, I would turn to the people who have uh, more expertise on that. But, um, but I, I can see that there are lots of, it's just an individualized thing of, of, of what works for you. And it, it sounds like you're looking for, um, I mean, I would guess, some kind of support system. And I think there are quite a lot of networks. Um, I am interested in advocacy simultaneously. I do have a strong personality. And by the way, I don't fear anyone. There's no fear. Um, What I want to do is I want to stop it. And what I want to do is I want to champion it. And I also want to make sure it doesn't continue. And it's also on a level of a a woman's issue, rights, Mm -hmm. as well as discrimination. So I don't know how to draw the line. I mean, it's, it's women. It's discrimination, and it's also inhumane. Okay. All right, I think, I think one interim step, I can suggest a book, and then maybe later on in the reception we can find a specific group depending on where you live, okay? okay. But there's a book called Trauma and Recovery, uh, 
uh, by Judith Herman, an excellent book, which, ha which by connecting all forms of trauma, war, concentration camps, child abuse, uh, rapes, so, you know, each form of trauma illuminates the other. She concludes that using what happened to you to help other people is the final stage of healing. Which is what I'm but very what interested in. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Gloria and Jessica and everyone there who I haven't had the privilege of meeting. Uh, my name is Sarah Jones and uh, I'm so grateful for this panel. Um, people have mentioned connections and how key um, they've been in you know, sort of across uh, each of your talks. And I think that's, you know, whether we're talking about uh, the Holocaust uh, or the current situations that uh, Mama Jean spoke of, or, and I'm actually really grateful to, you know, for Gloria to make the connections to uh, Native American cultures here. And then of course, the story of that genocide. And, you know, I remember learning the phrase rape, pillage, and plunder as a kind of basic notion of what was done in that, um, you know, hundreds of years scenario. So I'm, and, and then to have it connected to King Leopold and, and you know, 19th century uh, genocidal, um, you know, again, that's the same theme. Um, I'm, I guess, interested as a person of conscience, like everyone else in this room, what can we do? And I don't mean that you should have some, you know, kind of panacea, but the one thing Mama Jean mentioned in particular, coltan. It was a word that I just, you know, kind of picked out there. And if I hadn't been fortunate to hear from many of you, you know, from Gloria and others um, work with Equality Now and other uh, activists, I wouldn't know the connection between the coltan that's needed to run my cell phone and the economic, the continuing economic instability and exploitation uh, of the Congo. So what, I guess what I'm asking is, as people who maybe are unwittingly contributing to that economic instability, what, what are the kinds of steps we can take um, in our economic choices day to day? What are things that we can do besides contributing to people like Equality Now and, and others? How can we use what we know uh, in a practical way and kind of spread information? Because again, I, it, without um, the help of activists, I wouldn't know what coltan is. I wouldn't know that you know it's mining and it's natural resources that are being exploited and gun running and all kinds of other stuff going on around the sexual exploitation. So just wanted to ask and, that. And for those who don't know, this is Sarah Jones, who is one of our great performers who illuminates the world by Thank you, Gloria. by becoming literally inhabiting other people. So if you don't know her work, the next time you see her performing. Go. <laughs> Thanks, Gloria. Mama Jean, do you want to yes, address? No, uh, for Coltan, I don't know if you know about Coltan. As uh, is a scientific name is Columbine Tantalin. It's used for uh, to make uh, cell phones. Uh, all of those gadgets you have: iPod, the the new iPad, everything. It's why if you see uh, in uh, my board, I said for world to have all those uh, electronic device in Congo, there is one million and two thousand women, two hundred thousand women who is raped, and eight million death. And the rape in Congo start to uh, a three month baby to 85 old women. Even men is raped in Congo. For me, I say, it's why I said, we can, excuse me, what, what, what we are doing is to put a bandage, to end the, uh, uh, the rape in Congo, we must to stop the cause of rape. The cause of rape is the illegal exploitation of the natural resource. Mm -hmm. And all of those multinationals, they're not going to stop to do it. In Africa, they, they are not the industry, uh, weapon industry is not in Africa. Those industries of, uh, uh, of uh, weapon is uh, everywhere. And they must to, uh, to, to, to sell the uh, weapon in Africa, how to do it. 
is to use another Africa country to go to uh, kill and everything to be a, a, a way to go whatever they want, to do whatever they want <coughs> in Africa. It's what, for all of us to have uh, a good communication, uh, a sophistication uh, 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 laptop, mm. remember that. Yes, we, I think, that addresses the question of consumer education and consumer pressure. I mean, when this was first raised with Apple, for instance, they said, well, we can't possibly trace where our materials are coming from, but with enough consumer pressure, they were suddenly able to trace where their materials are coming from. So, you know, we, we are responsible. We have consumer power, and we are responsible. Yes. Okay, there are four here and two here, and we'll... Uh, be late, but not that late, but no one else can stand <coughs> up, okay? <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, my name is Chang Jin Lee. Uh, I'm a visual artist, and I'm working on a project about comfort women issue. Um, you know, 200,000 young girls uh, in Asia, um, known as a comfort woman, they were uh, sexually exploited uh, um, do, uh, before and do, uh, during World War II. Uh, from 1931 to 1945. Um, for the last several years, I traveled to Asia, uh, uh, Korea, Korea, China, Taiwan, and Indonesia to uh, meet survivors uh, to understand this issue better. Um, one thing I noticed uh, when I went there, um, you know, I think it's like there is, a, I was surprised that uh, there is so much shame involved with this issue, um, you know, because uh, for me, you know, these are Im amazingly, you know, courageous, outspoken women. I thought, you know, people that we should be proud of. But I realized when I went to Asia, it wasn't only Japan didn't want to, you know, talk about it, this issue, but also a lot of Asians wanted to forget as well because... Uh, Again, there's so much shame involved. Uh, you know, these are young girls, as, as young as 12 years old, and raped by 50 soldiers a day. So, mm -hmm. so I, I want to. I have several questions. Um, how Jewish people look at these, um, you know, sex slavery during during the Holocaust? How how they, you know, uh, you know, do do they? Can, can you? Speed up just a little bit. I'm worried about the time. Oh, yeah. Okay. And also, another thing is like, um, do we know how many were there? You know, it's like uh, sex slaves um, during the Holocaust, Jewish. Uh, and another is, uh, is there like a, some kind of uh, organized movement among Jewish people? Or uh, Because I saw in, in Asia, they were very kind of, well organized that they're still waiting for justice and like an official apology and acknowledgement from the Japanese government. So uh, is there anything like that? Well, I can, I'll answer very quickly. Uh, there is no organized movement. The Jewish community wishes this would go away. And what was the third thing? I, Oh, numbers. We don't know numbers because in most cases, as there was a law against sex between a Nazi and a Jewish woman, the easiest way not to have a witness was to kill the woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I must say, in talking to one survivor, that she felt that the women who were sexually used died sooner than the prisoners who were used as labor until they were too weak to work. Uh, and then sent into the ovens that actually the life expectancy was sure. was less, yeah, and that that's part of the reason that it, it it hasn't come out. And it was known at Nuremberg, right? And it was consciously excluded, consciously, right? Yes. My name is Gloria Blumenthal. Thank you very much. Um, as with many subjects um, in the related to the Holocaust, I, I just uh, bought a new book by Timothy Snyder called ba uh, Bloodlands, which um, uh, uh, depicts what happened behind what is now what was the Iron Curtain because there were very few survivors to tell it and people who lived behind 
the Iron Curtain, were not encouraged to give testimony. So um, like this, there are many areas that um, unfortunately um, are, very, are, are left to be explored. But the thing that I wanted to uh, uh, say is that um, I read, the reason why I came here in large part was because of Nava Semel. I, I uh, uh, found her book by accident a couple years ago and uh, it just, I've read a lot of books about the Holocaust and this touched me enormously. And I wanted to just, uh, the, the fiction, the whole thing. My mother was in hiding and her family, so I particularly, as a daughter of Holocaust survivors, um, related after hearing a lot about my um, mother's experiences. Luckily, um, uh, I, there were no stories of sexual abuse, but a lot of fear um, of being discovered, and, and they were not. Um, but my question um, to Nava or to anybody is, um, what is what I found spectacular about the book was the last, I guess, third, where the notion of memory, how, to, how do we use memory so that these stories can be told? They're not going to be told as a witness would tell it, but how, do you, how can we use memory? This occurs 100 years later. How do we do it now? And especially we keep hearing about how will people learn about it. We have facts and figures, but we've also said that art, fiction can be a way of um, hitting the nail on the head in a, in a much more um, gut kind of way. So that's my point. We're living in a world where, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, this world is already seen Holocaust denial, something which I wrote 12 years ago published in 2001, and people came to me and I said, Holocaust denial, are you nuts? What kind of a pessimist are you? And it's becoming a reality. The only tool I have against forgetting is remembering first as individual and then as a chain of rememberers. I call them rememberers in my book. Each and every one of us has a small responsibility of being a carrier, a memory carrier into the future. I tell my kids, one day you will have to speak to your grandchildren and tell them that your great, great, your grandmother was a survivor. You've heard about it. You've seen a survivor. Uh, because this danger of denial is, is not going to be a evaporated from the world. So it's our own individual responsibility to make sure that the memory of one Holocaust survivor will go into the future, each and every one of us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Falkenstein. I'm working uh, on some research on rape as a weapon of war. Um, very quickly, I won't give the whole story, but I was wondering what the impact of the mobile courts were, like such as in Fiji and, and other parts of Africa. Um, and also if there was uh, one particular thing that we in the audience could do moving forward, what would that one thing be? Did you understand? Yeah, yeah. yeah. the mobile courts are a project that was set up by the American Bar Association, for people who don't know, um, to try to assist bringing justice. I mean, in Congo, it's a huge country, and there are some places, so many places, where there aren't even roads to go there. And if there aren't courts, and there aren't local prisons, it's, there can't be justice. So this idea is to bring these mobile courts. Um, the impact was clearly huge in Fizi, where they brought a mobile court, um, and that's all the cases that, that I was talking about. Songomboyo also was a mobile court, because it's a village that has no court. Uh, I think it's a very good initiative. My own concern would be it's not that sustainable. It's expensive, you know, every time the UN is taking all of its aircraft to fly people in and out. So I think we need to look at a different form of justice that uh, starts from the ground and is present all the time because uh, the model is not really expandable. The, the other question, what can we do? That, that's a really hard question that I think we're all struggling with. In terms of Congo, I mean, the, the, I would, um, 
I, I would hope that the report that this high-level panel, high panel has done will lead to the creation of some kind of a reparations fund in the UN because literally billions of dollars are going into Congo and not reaching women who would benefit so much from $3 a month. So the question is how do we mobilize public pressure to make that happen because um, the UN is, is, is slow and, and, and sometimes not responsive at all. And so for me, that's an immediate target for me. But I think there are many different ways. I mean, Sarah, Sarah mentioned, I don't know if there is like a boycott movement. I have, I'm a little bit behind on some of those details. Uh, I know that on the cell phone front, there's actually a move to try to bring cell phones and cell phone service to women in the remote areas of Congo so that they can have some kind of alert system when uh, they're in trouble. So I think there are lots of initiatives going on, but, but public pressure, just getting the word out, channeling the outrage into whatever concrete actions uh, are, are going to be helpful is, is the bottom line. And you can go to the Equality Now website, you can go to the Women's Media Center website and others. Do you want to mention any others? I just uh, want to, uh, to add what, uh, what she said for the, uh, she talked about the cell phone to bring in Congo. It's, uh, it's very amazing because, you know, uh, in this part, all of us can have this, that there is one cell phone for 1,000 person in Congo. Those who are there victim for us to have all comfort. It's a double irony, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you all, the panel, for all you said. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here to hear. I'm, a, I'm from Rwanda, I'm a survivor. Um, um, uh, I lost a lot of uh, family members. Um, I'm also a victim of rape and also contracted HIV through rape. So um, it's really hard for me to hear all the things happening you know, to the women. It, it's, um, to me, um, it happened to me when I was young. I was um, 14 years old. and. It affected me, me a lot in so many areas in my life, so I feel like it's my duty myself to talk about it and also help to fight all these such thing to happen to, to happening to the women. And I feel like it's my responsibility to, if I will have kids or any, you know, whoever else will come, you know, will know what's, you know, what happened in our history. So. To me, I feel like I have to do, you know, I have to do something myself. So, in order to heal myself and also to help others. So, I'm trying to document it, so I hopefully I will do a book about, it, about the whole thing, so. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have two, two more, right? Thank you, my name is Edward Powers, and pardon, my apology, I got here late, because I had to navigate the traffic from Westchester to here, I was thinking it might be easier to drive across Tripoli than getting down here. But anyhow, um, I'm a physician and a surgeon, and over 40 years I have had the honor to take care of several patients who survived the Holocaust. And two women in particular come to my mind. Uh, one was a woman who was in her 60s. Uh, she was physically used uh, while in the camps. Uh, survived that. Came out, married another Holocaust survivor. They had a candy store in the Bronx. Two boys. And actually she held it together until she was in her 60s. And when I took care of her, she was schizophrenic, totally psychotic. Uh, her speech was a word salad. And then <clears throat> what stirred my imagination was some comments that was made on the panel. I'm thinking of another woman who the, uh, survived with her mother in Varshava. And she was fleeing in 1945 at the end of the war. The mother ran into a dispensary, shared a gurney with, and this is where the woman was born. And she was evacuated on a Soviet tank heading west. 
interesting. She's a trained analyst, PhD, you know, a lot of introspection and insight, but when she got into her 50s, uh, emotional breakdown. Um, and I don't know whether, it, maybe because I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I cut and sew for a living, uh, people opened up and, and told me those stories. So I was thinking of what you said, and I was thinking of what, I believe it's Nava Semel was talking about. And uh, my question is, is there a role in this process, in this healing process, for spirituality in terms of forgiveness, in terms of letting go for your own sake, and in terms of trying to develop that spirit within? Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody want to address spirituality? You know, I, I, think, I think we need to go through anger before we get to forgiveness, and we need to go through accountability before we get to spirituality, but I do think, uh, you know, since I'll just say what I think, which is that religion is politics in the sky. Spirituality is about the worth of every individual. So if that's what we mean by spirituality, I think... It's, it can get us beyond gender, beyond race, beyond divisions, beyond hierarchies, and into the circle where we belong. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add, add something, that, because uh, in Congo we are very Christian. There is 60% uh, uh, of uh, Congolese are Christian. And uh, for given, uh, forgiveness, I think it's a good way for all of those uh, women in Congo because it's what we tell them. If you don't forget, uh, forgive, you are not going to be healed by yourself. You must to God. What Christ, uh, Christ said, if you forgive, you will be forgiven. And start for that, with that, and you are going to, by yourself, to be uh, healed. And uh, we have many uh, um, uh, people who did it, and they are now uh, healed because they said, they don't know which way, and still, uh, still, uh, uh, give, uh, with it in the heart. It's good to uh, try to um, um, what, um, forgive and uh, forget it, mm. and uh, let it go and uh, move on. You know. I think we're so late now. We, yeah. I don't think we can go to that side. Right. Okay. All right. One more? Okay. Hi, I'm Deborah Schultz, and I've had the privilege of working on women's human rights internationally. And I just first of all want to thank you all for a great panel. And I speak really as an American Jew in saying that the way I see uh, my responsibility to remember the Holocaust is in learning about the present. And I'm really glad that we're talking about the Congo. Uh, as a Jew, when I hear six million, you know, I grew up hearing six million never forget. Six million have died in the Congo. Nine countries are involved in the Congo War. It's called Africa's World War. And, you know, we're starting to understand that coltan is integrated into our lives. So I just would like us to first learn more before we decide what our intervention is and support the Congolese women's movement because Congo does have a women's movement. And we need to ask Congolese women what they need, what they want, and in what form they need it before we decide what we're giving. Um, and I also just wanted to say that um, there is a really excellent organization that people can support that is trying to hold international justice uh, to promoting women's human rights, and that's the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice in The Hague. And you can just Google them. And um, you know, Jessica talked about pressure. We need to really put pressure on all of these institutions, frustrating as they are. And the International Criminal Court, although it's disappointed us a lot, has the opportunity to really make a global impact for gender justice. So I would really encourage us to learn more about that. All right, thank, thank you, you for a good activist last suggestion. And we must remember, let's see, we're not gonna blame the victim. We're not gonna blame the victim. We're gonna carry the truth of others, right? Uh, we're going to tell our own truth, really crucial, right? And we're going to make sure we do one outrageous thing <laughs> at least every day or every week. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope you will join us to talk more at the book signing and the reception at the Sackler Center, One Flight Up.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Please let's thank our panels. Thank you all very much. I know you're going to be tempted to come up and speak with everybody now. I'm going to ask everybody please to get to the elevators, go to the fourth floor. There'll be book signing and plenty of time for us to visit with all of our panelists and with Gloria Steinem. Thank you very much for coming. This was an extraordinary and wonderful opportunity for all of us.